Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and a very, very warm welcome to Uncover. My name's Josh, I'm a member of the Christian Union, and it's my pleasure again to welcome you along this evening. It's great to see you here. Well, Uncover's a week of events exploring some of the biggest issues of life and faith. And so every lunchtime this week, uh, we were looking at uh, life's big questions, and in these evening events, we've been considering the life that Jesus offers to us and the claims that he makes about himself. Well, this evening's title is Uncovering Hope, and uh, joining us in, in helping us think through that topic um, is Dr. Tim Keller again, who's been here with us all week. Tim's a New York Times best-selling author, and he leads a large church in Manhattan and has uh, spoken and taught in countries all around the world. Well, in just a minute, he's going to speak for about 30 minutes, and then after that, there'll be a chance to um, answer any of the questions that, that you have. So please be texting those questions in throughout this evening. That number will remain on the screen for the duration. So do text in your questions as you think of them. After uh, that, we, we'll hear um, from Alice, who's a student at St. Peter's, about how she began to grapple with uh, some of these issues for herself. And then at the end, we'll enjoy some more live music together. Well, now, Tim, let me invite you up and uh, have just on your way up, um, a couple of questions for you again. Um, hello. <laughs> Tim, it won't have escaped your attention that it is Valentine's Day today. Hmm. Um, <laughs> hmm. You're here with your wife, Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, we'd all love to know, how did you meet Kathy? Well, I went to, uh, I was an undergraduate with Kathy's uh, younger sister. She's uh, uh, two years younger than me. And uh, one of the things that, uh, her name was Susan, one of the things that Susan seemed to, to intuit was um, that I and, and Kathy were similar. So they were always, she was always saying, you know, you would like these books because my sister likes them. Uh, and or you would you or she would say right to you sometimes say, you ought to read this Tim Keller's reading this and and so when we actually showed up at theological college at the very same time we knew each other through Susan and uh, we just immediately uh, uh, took up with each other because we did know one another that way and the rest is romantic history <laughs> thank you I'll ask no more um. <laughs> yes let's just we will just uh, 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 draw a veil of discretion over the rest of the story. Good. Right, I'll move on to the next question. Yes. <laughs> you are English, you know, so I, you can only take so much. So. You're, bl you're blushing. I am blushing, yeah. <laughs> it's the lights. It's the lights. Now, we've been hearing each evening from an Oxford student about how they began to think through um, Christianity for themselves. How did that happen for you? How did you begin thinking about it? Well, I can be brief, but and I want you to know that no one from um, the uh, Christian Union paid me to say this, but there is a, uh, in the United States, there is a, um, uh, an organization of um, a Christian campus organization, university students organization that uh, descended from uh, the Oxford Christian Union and the Cambridge Christian Union many, many years ago. It was called InterVarsity, it still is over uh, there. And I was just drawn, I was brought along by a friend in my, uh, when I was a fresher at the first year and brought me along and I began to read uh, books that were uh, read over here in the same uh, circles. So people that most of them maybe would not have heard of uh, today, but anyway, people like I. Howard, I. Howard Marshall, F.F. F. Bruce helped me begin to trust the Bible actually. Uh, and of course, C.S. Lewis, who was also one of the people you read. And uh, like I said, uh, because Kathy and I, uh, when we were, became new believers, we read British books. For many years, we really thought that Jesus was our savior. <laughs> Until American uh, came along and explained to us uh, the, the faith better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, a few, a few people have noticed, Tim, over the course of your talks this week. You've referred to musicals on a number of occasions, from Frozen through to The Sound of Music. Are, are musicals a particular passion of yours? Uh, my, my, my parents, and especially my mother, loved them. And uh, when I was growing up, they're always playing. Uh, 
And so, unfortunately, when I first met Kathy, she, to her surprise, uh, and it wasn't because I tried, I knew many, many American musicals essentially by heart. So, and, and actually, when we, were, when we were first getting to know each other, I tried to impress her by reciting all of My Fair Lady, all of The Music Man, all of what, what else, everything. And uh, yeah, ca trouble with a capital T, and that rhymes with P, and it stands for pool. Okay. But uh, ever since then, she's been trying to get me to do it in public, and I have refused. <laughs> Tim, thank you for answering those questions. Yes. Um, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, and by the way, please do text in questions as they come to your mind as I'm speaking tonight. Um, I've uh, been delighted to be with you for these uh, five nights, and we have talked about such m massive themes. We've talked about how I've been arguing, actually, that Christianity can give you a meaning in life that uh, suffering can't take away. It can give you a satisfaction, a contentment that is abiding, it's not based on circumstances. We've talked about the fact that Christianity gives you a unique identity, different than any other, uh, different than any other culture will uh, give you because it's, it's not an achieved identity based on your performance, it's a received identity based on Christ's regard of you and because it's so unique, it's completely different. It's based on his regard of you, not on your performance. It doesn't wax and wane. Your self-esteem, your self-regard doesn't wax and wane depending on how successful you are in a given time or a given day, even in work or in love. Uh, it brings, we were talking about, it brings about a kind of unique freedom. Uh, if you, any other kind of identity, since it's based on performance, what it means is that uh, you might be humble if you're living up, if you're not living up to your standards, you're not performing well. You might be humble and kind and understanding to people, but not confident. If you are living up to your standards, you could be very confident and bold, but usually self-righteous and condescending toward others. But Christianity says in yourself, you're a sinner. In Jesus Christ, you're absolutely, utterly loved. There's no condemnation any longer for you. And that gives you a unique combination of both. You can't be superior to anyone. There's a humility and a boldness at the same time. There's all sorts of ways in which uh, the Christian identity, the Christian gospel gives you freedoms uh, from, what, uh, from cultural conformity, from public opinion. Uh, it gives you a satisfaction. It gives you meaning. And we're not done. One more. One more thing to talk about tonight. It gives you a future hope. And uh, uh, to do this, uh, to bring it out tonight, I want to read you a, one more passage uh, from the book of John. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 20. It's a short passage. It's verses 24 to 29. Very, very famous. Let me read it to you. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Now Thomas, who was known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, uh, this is a, an account of a time in which Jesus Christ, after his resurrection from the dead, appeared to Thomas. And here's what I like to uh, learn from this passage. First, about the necessity of future hope. It's absolutely necessary we have a future hope. And then secondly, something about the nature of the future hope that Christianity can give you. The necessity of future hope, the nature of the future hope that Christianity gives you. So first of all, the necessity. Uh, to get across what I mean by that, we are unavoidably, irreducibly, hope-based creatures. To uh, uh, demonstrate, imagine you uh, 
get two men. They are uh, men of the same age, they're the men of the same uh, socioeconomic status, uh, same educational level, they're men of the same temperament, so they're essentially identical in every way. And you hire them, and you uh, say, I want you every day, all day, to do a particular uh, operation. Let's say, put a widget on a wadget, over and over and over again. Pretty tedious. A widget and a wadget. And you put them in identical rooms, identical lighting, identical temperature, identical ventilation, identical conditions in every way. It's very boring work, 10 hours a day, uh, only 30 minutes off for lunch. Uh, and so it's, they're, they're, they're identical in every way, but only one difference. You tell the first man, at the end of a year, I will pay you 10,000 pounds. And you tell the second man, at the end of the year, I will pay you 10 million pounds. So after a couple of weeks, you know, they eat together, and the first guy is saying, isn't this tedious? Isn't this awful? Don't you hate it? Isn't it driving you insane? Aren't you thinking about quitting? And the, other, the second man says, no. No. Actually, I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> In fact, I whistle while I work. What's going on? Here you have two men who are experiencing the same circumstances in radically different ways and their experience is determined by their expected future. What they believe their, about their future completely controls how they're experiencing their present. They are, we are utterly, unavoidably, irreducibly hope-based creatures. And what we think about our future completely determines how you are experiencing your present. Uh, this is actually, there's ramifications of this for entire cultures. We won't even go into this, but uh, one of my favorite books is written by an American academic, uh, a, uh, uh, a secular author, by the way, not a Christian author, uh, Andrew Delbanco, who teaches at Columbia University, and he wrote a book some years ago called The Real American Dream, A Meditation on Hope. And uh, he's thinking at a cultural level, but listen to this, he says, the heart of any culture is its hope. Hope is the way we overcome the lurking suspicion that all of our getting and spending amounts to fidgeting while we wait for death. We must imagine some end to life that transcends our own, our own tiny allotment of days and hours if we are to keep at bay the dim back of the mind suspicion that we are adrift in an absurd world. Every culture, he says, has got to give people hope or else they do just sink into absurdity. Because what we think about the future, what our future is, completely determined, is, determines how we experience the present. Now, uh, what is the Christian response to this incredibly profound human need? And the answer is the fact of the resurrection. Why do I say fact? Well, let me just show you in the text. It's interesting that um, Thomas... Uh, says, uh, when everybody else says, Jesus is raised from the dead, we've seen him. And he says, I'm not going to believe that. So why, why, this is why this has been a very uh, precious text to many people, especially those of us of a more, and I say of us, of just a general skeptical bent. And he says, I'm not going to believe until uh, he appears to me and I can put my hands in his side where his wounds were and I can put my finger in the holes uh, where they uh, nailed put the nails and spikes through his hands. I'm not going to believe till then. And then what happens, of course, the, the account says that Jesus Christ appears to him visibly and then actually says, you can touch me. Now, and yet, the very last thing Jesus says almost seems to contradict what he's doing, what Jesus is doing by appearing. Because the last verse says, the last thing Jesus says is, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. So what he's saying, and there's plenty of people probably in this room who can attest to it, I certainly can attest, attest to it, you can actually certainly believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. You can achieve tremendous certainty about that without ever having had a visible uh, encounter, physical encounter with the risen Christ. Jesus says that right there. So if that's the case, if you don't really need this, why did he show up for Thomas? And the answer is, it says here, now Thomas, known as Didymus, was one of the twelve. He was one of the 12, 12 apostles. 
And the answer to my question is, Jesus, Thomas did not need to actually meet the risen Christ, physically encounter the risen Christ in order to be a believer, but he did need to encounter the physical and, uh, risen Christ to be an apostle, to be one of the 12. Because the apostles were Jesus' chosen uh, messengers who were going to take the message of the gospel, the message of Christ, to the world. And the fact that, that uh, Thomas needed to actually see Jesus risen from the dead tells me something, tells us something about that message. What is that message? Well, the message of Jesus Christ, the, the core of the message of the gospel is not Jesus' ethical teaching. Jesus had wonderful ethical teaching. Uh, turn the other cheek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Forgive your enemies. Very famous. Come down to us. Marvelous, sublime. But Thomas didn't need to see the risen Christ if his job was to transmit the message and the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. At the core was live a good life. Love, forgive, peacemake. Is that the core of what it means? No. See, it's a historical fact that the message of Jesus Christ changed I mean, it, it, it changed so many lives and it spread so much through the masses that within 200 years, that incredibly strong, classical, Greco-Roman, pagan culture was almost completely supplanted by Christianity. It's astounding. And the only way that could have happened was not because there was a little Christian movement here or there or that uh, some of the intellectual classes or some of the middle classes uh, became Christians, so we had uh, a different kind of society. No, the masses went Christian. The downtrodden went Christian. They're still going Christian. Go to Latin America and go to Africa now. And what would the poor and the downtrodden, what would change their lives about Christianity? The ethical teaching? Is that what the poor and downtrodden? What, are the poor and the downtrodden going to say, oh, turn the other cheek? Uh, blessed are the peacemakers forgive your enemies now finally finally I, I have a message that after my years of darkness say the poor and the downtrodden I finally have got some way to conquer my despair and something that will uh, change my life and something that will heal my heart no they need a message of hope and here's the message of hope the message of Christianity is not what you must do it's not Here's the ethical prescriptions, now live like this. That would be one more burden on us. No, the message of Christianity is what Jesus Christ has done. That he died and rose. That's the reason why Thomas had to see it. That he died and rose. That's the message of Christianity. That when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he took away the barrier between us and God. And when he rose from the dead, he destroyed sin and death. That's the reason why the downtrodden of the world can say... No matter who I am or what I've done, no matter what I've been, no matter what the record is, I can be reborn into the kingdom of God. And whatever level of success in this life I have in my struggle for freedom, I still have hope. Why? Because my future is certain. Because the resurrection's a fact. The resurrection's not a fact. There is no message of hope. All you've got are ethical Good ethical principles. In fact, you know, today there's plenty of people who say that's the heart of Christianity. We can't take the Bible literally, they say. We can't take the resurrection literally. We can't believe in that. Uh, we believe the resurrection is a wonderful symbol. What it means to be a Christian is to live a good life, live according to the teachings of Jesus, and the resurrection is a wonderful symbol. All right, what's it a symbol of? Well, it's a symbol of how even in the darkest times there's always hope. That's not true. Have you not lived life? Life is not like that. Sometimes there's hope after darkness, but a lot of times there's none, none at all. And if you say the resurrection is a symbol that reflects the fact of life, that there's always hope after darkness, it's a lie because life's not like that. The resurrection as a symbol of how life is, it's a lie. But the resurrection as a fact can actually change life. Because if the resurrection really happened, then Jesus Christ has opened a cleft in the pitiless walls of the world. There was this concrete slab, as it were, between the ideal and the real. And in the resurrection, Jesus Christ punched a hole in it. 
and now the divine life comes in. If the, if the resurrection's a fact, then the downtrodden of the world said, now I've got something that I, I, I have a hope. I've got a hope for the future. I've got a hope for myself. Not here's a bunch of nice, wonderful principles. Because if that's all you have, listen, middle class people sometimes can get excited about philosophy. They can get excited about ethical principles, but not the masses, not the people who are really stuck in the darkness of this world. The resurrection as a fact, the resurrection as a fact, that's what changes life, that's what changes your life, and that's what will change the world. Now, let's just take a second here, because some of you are saying, how do you know it's a fact? And you know, finally, especially if you've been here before, finally I can say, not only am I talking to you about something that Christianity offers, so powerful that you should want it to be true, finally I'm talking about something that also is strong evidence that it is true. <laughs> And that's the resurrection itself. Um, look, Richard Dawkins uh, says you shouldn't believe anything you can't prove. He doesn't like faith. Don't believe anything you can't prove. He does admit at one point, I don't have the actual page, but he does admit at one point, though, that there's nothing that happened in history that we can prove just the way you prove a logical theorem or the way you prove uh, you know, something in a test tube. And yet, it would be foolish not to say we can be sure of many historical facts. No, you can't prove them in the same way you can prove you know, something logically, demonstratively. But you certainly can say there are such things as historical facts. And I believe if you just use the, the ways in which people check out uh, the truth of historical claims, the resurrection is a historical fact too. I'll just, just, just a little tiny slice of two. Just think like this. Here's a little bit of historical reasoning. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how do you account for the birth of the Christian church. Give me a historically viable alternate explanation. You may say, well, resurrection is not an explanation. Okay, give me a better explanation because here's what happened. We know from the letters of Paul, at least, Paul's first letters were written just a decade and a half or so after Jesus' life. And we know from Paul's letters that there were thousands of Jews who virtually immediately after the death of Jesus Christ began worshiping him as God on the strength of the fact that he was raised from the dead. They were worshiping him as God. Now look, in the East, when the idea of God is God is, is uh, in everything, to talk about an individual being a God or an avatar or something, that's no big deal. But the Jews' understanding of God was he was infinitely transcendent above the world. He's the creator of all things, self-sufficient, and the idea that a human being would be God, the Jews were the last people on the face of the earth to believe that a human being would be God. They won't even, you know, Orthodox Jews even to this day will not, they won't even write the name of God. And yet thousands of Jews almost immediately began worshiping Jesus as God. Look, worldviews change, but not overnight. You know, there's papers written and there's books written and there's, and there's parties that begin and there's divisions and there's fights. Not overnight. What did it? And the answer, of course, is the claims were that we, hundreds of people saw him, not just one or two. Hundreds of people saw him raised from the dead. And one thing on the witness, which I, you know, is the simplest one to quickly convey, you say, well, how do you know that those witnesses were credible? Well, in the Gospels, and this is one of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got early eyewitness accounts of Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do we know that those things are reliable? Well, there's a lot of tests, but I'll just give you one. The first people in every gospel account who saw Jesus Christ, every single one of them, the first people were women. We know that in that very patriarchal society, women had such low status that both in Roman courts and in Jewish courts, women's testimony was not admissible evidence. They were considered unreliable. You know, that's, that's lamentable, but that's the way it was. And therefore, if you're making up an account of Jesus' resurrection, if you're trying to push your faith, you would never, never in a million years put women as the first witnesses. There would have been enormous prejudice on the part of almost any pagans reading that thing. So give me, give me an explanation for why women are in there as the first witnesses. About the only possible reason that they'd be in those texts is if they were. And they just had to be put in there because they were. That was the story. There's no other reason why they, they would be in there. There's quite a bit of evidence that the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
happened. And if the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened, then it's not what he said, but what he did that will really change your life. If Jesus Christ came mainly as a teacher and said, like all the other founders of all other religions, and said, live like this and you will find God, then he'd be no different than all, and Christianity wouldn't be different than any other religion. But Jesus Christ is not one more founder saying, here's the way to God. Jesus Christ says, I'm God, come to find you. Every other religion says, here's what you have to do to save yourself. Here's the eightfold path, here's the five pillars. Here's what you must do to save yourself. Jesus Christ says, no, I have come to do what saves you. I'm not here to tell you what you must do. I'm telling you what I've done to save you. I lived the life you should have lived. I died the death you should have died in your place as your substitute so that when you believe in me, my resurrection power comes in and begins to change your life now and at the end of time, you'll be raised physically and you'll be part of that and glorious future. That is the future hope that Christianity offers. And the reason I'm going to not end right here because I said, this is why we have to have a hope, and this is the power of a hope. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why the Christian future hope is actually unique. Because I can just hear a question coming saying, well, aren't there other, um, you know, religions that offer an afterlife and that sort of kind of hope? Yeah, but let me give you three ways in which Christi the Christian hope is unique. It's unique because it's personal, because it's certain, because it's unimaginably wonderful. It's, first of all, it's personal. Notice when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he recognizes him. He recognizes him. There's actually a lot of interesting discussion um, in all of these first accounts. Uh, when the, uh, on the road to Emmaus, when the two disciples meet Jesus, when Mary Magdalene meets Jesus, they look, at first they don't, and then they say, oh, it's you. It's still Jesus. Jesus is still himself. Do you know how important that is? both in East today, in Eastern countries, but also in ancient times, the Greeks, the Greek philosophers believe this. And today, especially in the West, more and more people are trying to mitigate the problem of, of being afraid of death, being despondent in the, in the face of death. We showed, I think I quoted earlier this week, how Tolstoy at one point said just that the idea of extinction just made everything he was doing uh, meaningless. And uh, one of the ways in which we deal with this in our modern culture is to say, hey, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We continue, even after death, we're still part of life. Remember the Lion King? There's the great Lion King, and he's talking to his son, Simba. And he says, Simba, Simba, yes, yes, we do eat antelopes. We, you know, we chew them to bits. It's, you know, it's bloody, it's awful. But, but, when we die, our bodies fertilize and enrich the ground and out of the ground grows the grass and the antelopes eat the grass and then we eat the antelopes and so we're all, it's all part of the circle of life. We're all part of the circle of life, how wonderful. Uh, and, uh, and when you die, you, you stay as part of the circle of life so you continue in a way. Now in a way, the Greek Stoics believe something like that too. Eastern folks say the same sort of thing, uh, Eastern uh, religions I mean. And, and, and so why be afraid? Why be afraid? Because you continue on in, a, in an impersonal way, of course, because you're either part of the ground or you're part of the cosmos in some way, but you're all part of the circle of life. But look, if our future after death is non-existence or impersonal existence, that means there's no love there. Because in order to have love, you have to have persons. And there's, if, we're not, if you're not yourself after death, if you're not a self after death, then you've lost everything. Because see, what we most want in life is love. And where we, where our life is most meaningful when we have love. And once we have love, the most important thing in the world is not to lose love. And you're gonna tell me, oh, it's wonderful, you're just part of the circle of life. You're gonna tell me that at death, I'm gonna be stripped of everything that means anything to me. Because what I want more than anything else is love without parting. I want love, you want love, and in order to do that, you just gotta be persons. And it's of no consolation, that kind of hope. No consolation at all, not if you think about it. And you know, John Updike, in his uh, memoirs uh, called Self-Consciousness, it's just a memoir of his life, he actually, his last chapter, where he talks a little bit about why 
He was a Lutheran Christian, and why Christianity was important to him. You can, t you, you actually, I don't even have to tell you, I'll just tell you, um, I'll tell you what the answer is by the title of his last chapter in his book, On Being a Self Forever. On Being a Self Forever. Not part of the circle of life, not just part of stardust, not just part of the ground, it's on being a self. And I think what's going to happen to us, if we believe and we're resurrected, something like what was happening to them on the road to Emmaus, we're going to look at each other and we're going to say, it is you, isn't it? Yeah. I saw a seed of this in you in our earthly life. But now look at you. Look at how beautiful you are. Look at how glorious. I knew you could be like this. And now you are. See, that's what you want. That's the hope of your heart. Christianity gives it to you. It's a personal future. Secondly, though, uh, kind of briefly, it's, a, it's also a certain future. Here's what I mean. This hope is of no real um, value to you if you're not sure that, it, that you're going to get there. See, sometimes you say, I've had people say, well, the resurrection is wonderful, but I don't know. I don't know if I'll make it. I don't know if the God's going to, has, I don't know if he's really accepted me. I don't, how do I know that this is really going to happen to me? How do I know? Well, weirdly enough, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the way for you to be certain that if you believe in him, you'll be resurrected. You know why? You know what the resurrection of Christ is? It basically is the vindication of the cross. Or another way to put it is, it proves that the cross was effective. Or let me put it like this. Uh, if you're um, convicted of a crime and the judge says, sentenced, five years in prison. Okay, so broke the law, wages of, of sin is five years. So you go into prison and when you have paid the price, when there is nothing more to pay, when you have fulfilled and satisfied the demands of the law, how do you know that you have fulfilled and satisfied the demands of the law? You get out. You walk out. And because you're walking out, that means it's all been paid. The Bible says, what, is, what are the wages of rebelling against God, refusing to allow God to be God in your life, refusing to acknowledge the fact that you owe him everything, but you, you live your life the way you want? What is the wages of that? death and when Jesus Christ died and then walked out it meant it was paid it was paid you know I'm sure that in Britain everybody trusts everybody else it's not that way in America I just want you to know that because in America when you go into a store a department store uh, something like that you buy something and then they give you a uh, the, the purchase, they give it to you, and you're walking around it, with a bag, and there are these things they call plain clothes policemen in the stores, or generally security guards in the stores who are watching for shoplifters. So sometimes they'll come over to you because they see you walking around with the uh, a package and say, could I look in that package, please? Because they're trying to see whether or not everything in the package was purchased. And if you are of a more dramatic sort, and uh, there are many Americans who are, what you do is, you, they walk over and they say, could I look in there? What you do is you open up, you reach in, and you find the receipt, and you pull it out and you say, trouble me not. <laughs> this is proof that I've paid. You cannot make me pay for it again. And, of course, uh, the, uh, the plainclothes policeman, you know, usually uh, backs away in, with confusion of face and says, forgive me uh, for even questioning you. But you know what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is? It's a receipt. It is a receipt stamped across history in letters so big that nobody can fail to see them that your sin, your debt, has been paid in full. And you can be certain. If he was raised from the dead, you believe in him, you will be. Here's one more thing, and it's important. And that is that the resurrection is unimaginably wonderful. Uh, yeah, there's, others, there's other uh, religions that offer an afterlife. I told you some of them offer only an impersonal afterlife. That's not the deep need of the heart. We need love. Well, but aren't there others that offer a personal afterlife? Yeah, but it's only heaven. It's only spiritual. And the resurrection, by definition, means the redemption not just of my spirit, but of my body. And the resurrection means that God's going to actually renew the material creation. He's going to give us a new heaven and new earth. And you know what this means? 
This means that, well, listen, let me start like this. One of the things that I, one poem, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, which in some ways is very, very dark, in some ways very, very hard to understand, but it's very powerful because you have this black bird, the raven, constantly saying over and over and over again, nevermore, nevermore. And even though I'm not utterly sure of this, and I probably should read some literary criticism of it, it seems to me that what Poe is getting across is the irretrievability of life. There's a kind of death in the midst of life. And the longer you are alive, the more you'll start to experience that death in the midst of life. And that is when things go away that, that you know, at least within the walls of this world, will never be brought back to you. Some, sometimes there are opportunities that you've missed. I mean, some of you as young people already know you've missed some opportunities that will never come back to you. Uh, it's not just that. There's, there's people that you lose you know will never come back, and relationships, and even places. I mean, for Kathy and I, it's, uh, it's uh, her family's old summer cottage on the shores of Lake Erie. Not only are the cottages gone forever, but the beach is gone forever. And, and there's an irretrievability, there's a loss in the middle of life, which is a kind of death in the middle of life. And the resurrection says no to nevermore. Because the resurrection says, you are not simply going to get a consolation for the life you've lost. You know, that's heaven, bliss. You're not just going to get a consolation for the life you lost. You are going to get a re the restoration of the life you lost. You, you won't just get your body back. You'll get the body back that you never had, that you wished you had. You won't just get your life back. You'll get the life back that you never had, but you wished you had. You're not going to miss out on anything. It's because this isn't just a, a consolation, it's, it's, a, it's a restoration. In that great article, which was a lecture by J.R.R. Tolkien, called On Fairy Stories, he tries to explain why it is, um, and this has very much irritated the, the, the literati you know, of the world, that people still spend so much money on reading and consuming movies, plays, books, stories, that are fairy tales. They're, um, uh, th those are the movies that are blockbusters. They've got magic in them and they've got sorcerers and they've got you know, dwarves and elves and hobbits and things like that. And then people just, instead of the high literature, realistic fiction, that's what people want to imbibe. And he was trying to explain what's going on there. And he actually said, they were at five, they're in the, in the uh, essay, he said there's five things that human beings seem to have a such a deep longing for. And those five things are to be able to step outside of time, to escape death, to have love without parting, to hold communion with non-human beings, and to see good finally triumph over evil. Yeah? Step outside time, escape from death, love without parting, uh, communication with non-human beings, and good triumphing over evil. And he says, we have such a deep longing that we cannot get rid of uh, that, that fantasy fiction, fairy tales, uh, even though we know they're fairy tales, even though we know they're not realistic, we, uh, especially if they're told well, it, it gets to something in us that is satisfying, that we, we just want to see it depicted. And when we see it depicted well, it brings a joy. We just... Because somehow, deep down, we sense this is the way the world ought to be. In some ways, we're getting in touch with some kind of reality, not, not real life, but maybe a reality, of the life as it ought to be. And Tolkien says, realistic fiction will never scratch that itch. Realistic fiction will never quench that thirst. And people will still spend all this money and, and spend all this time, and they uh, well-told stories that depict those five things. We want them. We long for them. Now, Christians have a good ex explanation for that. It's a memory trace. We believe it's a memory trace deep in the soul. Human beings all know that that's what we originally were made for. But here's what the resurrection means. Think about this. Listen. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact, all those five things will come literally true for you. No, they're not true now, of course. They're fiction. Escape from death. Stepping outside time, communication with non-human beings, love without parting, good triumphing over evil finally. 
if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fact and you believe in him, those aren't fairy tales. They won't be anymore. Why wouldn't you want that to be true? <laughs> See, the resurrection, uh, how do I put it? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no greater human hope possible. There's, the heart wants this, desperately wants this. Nothing can answer the deepest needs of the human heart like this. And even if you're not sure it is true, you should certainly be motivated to find out if it is true. If you're ready, actually, to find out whether it's true tonight and make a kind of a, 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 a commitment to that, I will come back and I will talk to you about that in my wrap-up. But right now, you're going to hear, uh, and I'm hoping you've got questions, you're still texting them in. Uh, right now, we're going to hear a, uh, one more account of a spiritual journey of an Oxford uh, student. And after that, um, Josh will come back, we'll do the questions and answers, and then we'll wrap up. I wasn't trying to discover what life was all about or anything when I arrived at Oxford, but I met some Christians and I was intrigued by the way that they lived. I'd heard some Bible stories growing up, but why did these people believe them as truth and history, and how come they let Jesus affect the whole way that they lived their lives? I noticed how the Christians who invited me along to things behaved differently, how they were really welcoming to everyone, and went out of their way to selflessly do things for other people. I started going along to some Christian Union meetings and hearing more from the Bible and seeing how people were trusting in God as they prayed for each other. I even went along to a few days away with the Christian Union at the start of Hillary term of my first year. There the speaker was talking about how the Kingdom of God is all about relationships of love, how it's because God loved us so much that he sent his son to us and he died to save us, to save me. As we sang together, I was struck by the incomprehensible amount of love that Jesus had, that he was willing to bear the cost of death, to take everything that we ever have and ever will do wrong upon himself so that we can have eternal life in a perfect world. I heard the Bible verse, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I thought it was pretty good really that God would do all of this for us, but there isn't anything that we have to do to receive it apart from ask, so I did. I can see now why Christians try and live the way that they do. When you've discovered the enormous amount of love that God has for us, how could you not want to try and share that by loving others? When you've seen a perfect example of the way that Jesus lives and behaves towards anyone he meets in the Bible, how could you not want to try and imitate that even a little bit? And when you've accepted the amazing gift of eternal life in a perfect world, how could you not want to try and share that with others? It's amazing to think that I know God, that I can always rely on him, pray to him and trust him, although that definitely isn't always easy, but I'm so grateful that Jesus died for me to make that relationship possible that I can have even more joy at the beauty of the world now that I can thank the one who made it, and that I have a hope for a better world in the future that can never be taken away. Great, we're gonna go for some question and answers now before Tim concludes the evening. So let's have our first question up, please. We accept scientific things based on falsification, not verification. As you said, like how Dawkins said, nothing in history can be proven logically. Can the resurrection be falsified? Uh, well, I do think that would be possible. I mean, there, there, people have tried to do it with certain, th with certain findings. You might, uh, uh, it, it seems like there could be documentary um, evidence, for example, eyewitness accounts uh, to the body being stolen. I mean, I do think that there might be other things that you could, you're asking in a sense theoretically, yes, of course, I do think just like almost any, pretty much any historical event um, can be falsified by um, uh, some kind of documentary evidence, some kind of eyewitness account, some kind of, uh, uh, or even, even certain, um, cer certain historical facts that make it extraordinarily unlikely that uh, this other thing happened. I think what I didn't say, but I ought to say, as long as you don't have a philosophical presupposition that says resurrections can't happen, and I could understand why you might have one, uh, but it, you're supposed to take that out when it comes to looking at history. You're not supposed to bring your philosophical presuppositions in. Uh, you'd have to find a historical document or historical account that made this other historical claim unlikely or impossible. And as far as I know, people have been sifting the evidence for the resurrection for many, many years. Um, 
uh, it, to, if you, you go in the back, uh, the books that are out there will have some, um, some accounts of this, but even, for example, in my own book, I give a brief account of it, but I give you other kinds of longer, uh, better, frankly, and uh, uh, historical uh, studies that would show that. So, yeah, the answer is it could be falsified. It hasn't been. Arguing that the resurrection is true from the spread of the church does not hold. Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism have all spread and grown as religions. People have died for such faiths. What is it that distinguishes, distinguishes Christianity and its claims and makes you think Christianity is true rather than some of the other faiths or claims? Yeah, that's, uh, on the surface, that looks like a great objection, but I think it says, uh, arguing that the resurrection is true doesn't hold because, I didn't say it's because the um, Christianity spread. I said it was because Jews who had a massive worldview change in their lives because they said they saw Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Uh, there's no similar kind of claim. I mean, the, 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 uh, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism largely are ethical religions. They're largely saying, here's how you have to live. Ethical religions or any movement, any movement like that grows because uh, this sounds reasonable, this sounds good, I wanna live like this. Christianity started out with a very falsifiable claim. A, a, uh, a radical claim that required an immediate worldview change. I don't think, frankly, Christianity did spread the way the other religions spread. Doesn't hope for an afterlife lead to complacency? Um, I think a certain kind might. Uh, but, uh, and, and here's one of the great dangers here is that uh, you can't take what I said tonight and take it away from what I said other nights. Uh, the resurrection gives you hope for the future, but Christianity doesn't simply tell you when you're dead, everything will be fine. Christianity also gives you plenty of motivations for uh, uh, simply serving God now. I mean, I tried to say earlier that uh, generally religion uh, says if you obey, if you do all these great things in life, uh, then God will uh, take you to heaven and listen to your prayers. That's actually a burden that crushes you. And even though you, it, it, it is a, frankly, it's a motivation. <laughs> uh, it gets you out of complacency to say, you gotta earn your own salvation. Wow, yeah, you're not gonna be complacent, you're gonna be, work but you're also gonna be crushed. Christianity doesn't just come in and say, oh, you're, you're accepted, you know, uh, no problem. Christianity says, at infinite cost to the Lord Jesus Christ, he died for you, so now you are, living without condemnation, and any normal human being, if you believe that, immediately says, I want, I want to serve you, I want to become like you, I want to please you. Anybody who's done anything like that for you, anything close to that, you don't just say, well, thanks. You, you, you're moved and you say, what can I do? How can I, how can I help? I mean, what can I do? Uh, you served me, how can I serve you? That's natural, and therefore, the cross does not lead to complacency. The resurrection, I guess, technically might, if it, if it existed in, uh, you know, abstract, it was abstracted from the cross, but it's not. Does the fact that Jesus rose from the dead undo the sacrifice? If you get your speeding fine refunded, you haven't really paid anything. And then I'm assuming this is the same question. Yeah. Could God not have canceled the debt? Yeah, well, now, uh, yeah, I, I, under, look, I, I do understand that. It's, it's like saying, if... if it is true, for example, a parent, if a, pa let's see, if a parent pays uh, your, the child's way and the child never has to do anything, it can create complacency. Um, but uh, it, it's really not so much that you, you're getting the, the money back. It's not that you're getting the money back. It's that Jesus, Jesus Christ paid it and I really, actually, I mean, you didn't, whoever texted that question and didn't hear my last answer, and I think my last answer to some degree uh, speaks to this one. And that is, it's Jesus' payment of the debt that makes me want to serve him. And uh, I don't in any way say, well, I actually, no, nobody really died. Maybe I mentioned this. I think I, I said this one other night. If, if somebody comes to your house and uh, uh, at a party in a very stupid way gets drunk and breaks a piece of your furniture. 
Uh, oh, I'm so sorry, he says. There's two things that can happen. Either you can say, please pay to replace the furniture. That's one way. The other thing you could say is, I forgive you. Don't worry about it. But then you pay for it, or you go without. So either the debt doesn't go into the air. Either the person pays, or the forgiver pays. But somebody pays. And if Jesus Christ has paid for me, then it's not like I get my money back. It means that he saved my life. And because he saved my life, I want to serve him. I want to love him. I want to please him. I want to become like him. And the motivation is incredibly natural and it's internal. And so I, I, I don't think, I, I see, I mean, we're using analogies. And every analogy is partly true to the reality. And the analogy of the payment and the debt and the refund, I wouldn't see it as a refund. He paid Hey, two questions? Isn't that cheating? Um, I think I answered the question. I, to cancel a debt to you. So, you know, if you're just saying, uh, if, you know, if I punch Josh in the nose, uh, uh, you know, you could say, well, Josh could forgive me, but if God, God, if God cancels the debt, that would be unjust. But the fact of the matter is, uh, God made both of us, and um, uh, God loves Josh, God is, Josh is God, I'm, uh, God loves me, and if I violate him, I'm actually also sinning against God. And so when Jesus Christ dies on the cross to forgive our sins, he has to absorb the debt himself. He can't cancel it. Debts don't actually go away. Somebody has to pay. God paid. Great, time for another question. Why do Christians not float in a euphoria if Christianity is so great? Well, you know, um, because we walk by faith, not by sight. And um, the faith is always uh, uh, partial. You know, the place where, where Jesus, I mean, not Jesus, where Paul, it, it's, it's very poetic, and you probably heard it because it's in 1 Corinthians 13, and it was read at weddings, and so... It sounds very poetic, but think about it. He says, now we see in a glass darkly, which is his way of saying, um, especially back in those days, mirrors were not very nice. I mean, mirrors were not like our mirrors today. They were usually polished bronze or something. So when you looked into a mirror, you could kind of see your face, but it was always somewhat distorted. It was kind of dark. And that's the analogy of what it means to walk by faith. It means that Christians always only partially experience the realities. I even hinted at this last night. We, we have this incredible identity. It takes all of our lives for us to live into that identity. We only get there partially. Uh, we have this incredible hope. We only get there partially because we, we walk by faith, not by sight. And we uh, uh, also, we, our hearts are still allergic to God, even though we're forgiven. And even though they're turning, there's still a great deal of allergy there. And so for all those reasons, yes. But Christians really, that, I, I shouldn't be making an excuse for us because I'm a Christian, and the fact is, in fact, maybe we ought to talk about this in, in the, in the wrap-up. Uh, we prob those of us who are Christians here might spend some time reflecting on why we don't let the hope of the resurrection sweeten our daily life in a way that it doesn't right now. Great. Time for one final question, I think. Isn't hope, in some sense, another name for wish fulfillment illusion? Well, I don't think you would say that about all hope, would you? I mean, obviously, I mean, let's get, uh, if somebody says, if you work really hard, you'll, you know, you'll get a first in this, in this class, um, and you work really hard and you get the first, that wasn't an illusion. I mean, if you're asking whether uh, the resurrection is an illusion and the afterlife is an illusion, I gave you, uh, rather brief, but I gave you uh, at least a way for you to go and find out whether it's an illusion or not. Uh, I'll just end like this. The great thing about the resurrection, unlike in some ways the other topics I gave you this week, is the resurrection not only, oh, it's, it not only is an astounding uh, desire of the heart. When it's described, you say, oh, if, if that were true, if that were true. But it's also an evidence that it is true. It's not just a great thing. It also gives you evidence that it actually is true. The evidence is out there. You, you really should take the time. I would hope you'd think it was sensible use of your time to discover whether it's an illusion or not. I don't, it is not, it is not, okay. Thank you, well that's all we have time for with Q&A. So just before Tim concludes the evening, um, I'll just mention if your question didn't get answered, then Tim will be around for a little while 
um, afterwards at the front, so do come and speak to him. Uh, he also mentioned the book stall, which is just outside the, the double doors at the back. There's books on there relating to some of the things we've been talking about throughout the week, so do go and check that out. Also on your seat is a uh, little John's Gospel, a copy of John's account of the life of Jesus. That'll be really helpful to you in thinking these things through. And also, if you have... Um, uh, if you'd like to kind of watch or re-watch any of the other talks from this week, they're all up um, on the website now. So if, you, if you're interested in those, it's uncoveroxford.org, and then there's a little um, link at the top, listen to a talk. Tim, over to you to wrap up. These evenings are like Peter Jackson movies. There's four endings. So that was the first ending. I'm the second. Then Josh will be back for the third, and then there'll be a fourth, right? So Now, here's how I'd like to end. <clears throat> I'm actually going to give you a minute of quiet to reflect um, and there will be uh, you, I think you'll probably fall into one of three categories let me start with the first one um, if you are at this point if you'd like to take the first step if you'd like to say I think I'm ready to or at least I'd like to know how could I put my faith in Christ you talk about it you sound you give me a lot of pyrotechnics this week please bring it down to the ground. How do you do this? How do you put your faith in Jesus Christ? And uh, the, uh, the two things that the, the, in the Bible, if you start to read the scripture and you start to look and say, well, where does it, you know, what's the Bible's answer? It, it boils down to two uh, words usually, repent and believe. Repent and believe in Jesus or repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. And, and the, the reason those two things always go together and you need to keep them together is... Uh, it's not just repent and believe because if without repentance belief could mean I'm supposed to just subscribe to a set of doctrines repent means to turn away believe means to turn to to two sides of the same coin you really can't do one without the other to turn away and turn to repent I would say and this might help you I hope uh, you should repent at two levels at the first level it's more the common sense level if there's anything you think you have done wrong, anything you feel like you need forgiveness for at all, anything that still bothers your conscience, repent. Repent of that. Repent of sins. Repent of wrongs. Repent of wrongdoing. But at a, at a, it's important if you're going to find Christ and put your trust in Christ, you have to look underneath and say, what am I really trusting now? I need to repent of that. Am I just trusting in my own mind, my own self-sufficiency? Am I trusting in, in academics? Am I trusting in, uh, what am I trusting in? to help me make it in life? What are my resources? What am I looking to in a way to save me, even though you wouldn't have used the term save or salvation? What am I really trusting in? What am I really hoping in? What is my real meaning in life? What have I been looking for as the source of my satisfaction? What is it? Is it just your smarts? Is it another person? Is it a, uh, your, the, the, the hope of a career? Whatever it is, that's what you have to turn away from. You have to turn away, not just from doing bad things. You have to turn away from, in a sense, self-reliance, self-salvation, being your own Savior and Lord. You have to say, I repent of that. And then you turn, and what does it mean to turn? You put your faith in Jesus. And so you say, oh, I wish I had faith. You've got faith. You're already putting your meaning and your hope and your satisfaction in other things. That's called faith. So I'm saying, take it away from those things and put it in Jesus. Repent and believe. And maybe it comes down to something like this. You could say something like, Father, please accept me as your child because of what Jesus Christ has done, not because of what I've done or ever will do or can do, but because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. Father, accept me, not for my works, because of what Jesus Christ did. And I turn away from trusting anything else and living for myself, and I follow you. If you say something like that tonight, I think you've crossed the line into faith. Or if you say, I'm not ready to do that, well, at least now you have some building blocks. So here's what I like. Here's three kinds of people here. I'm going to give you one minute of silence, believe it or not. The one is, those of us who are Christian believers, why don't we ask, why don't we, why don't we pray and say, Lord, my resurrection hope is not sweetening my daily life like it ought to. And I'm sorry, please, make, please help me change that. Number two, you might want to pray that prayer. Father, Heavenly Father, accept me not because of what I've done, but what Jesus Christ has done. I turn from trusting anything else, give myself to you. Or you might just want to reflect and say, I don't know what I think about all this. Okay, you've got 60 seconds to think about it.
Thank you for giving that time. And now Josh is going to come back and he's going to close us up.